pray that you have uh, done that with your heart uh, to confess the Lord Jesus as Savior, to open your heart to him and dedicate your entire life to his kingship uh, as both Lord and Savior of your heart. Uh, what a joy it is. Isn't God good? Isn't he? He is good. He is very good. And, and uh, we are grateful as a body to uh, continue to uh, make disciples uh, who fulfill the great commandment and the great commission, okay? Uh, we are a congregation of people uh, that is uh, Bible-directed, outreach-focused, and prayer-driven, okay? So this is who New Hope is, and if you're brand new with us, uh, this is what you can expect, a ministry that is Bible-directed, outreach-focused, and prayer-driven. Uh, and speaking of prayer-driven, we have uh, uh, a 28-day uh, prayer challenge uh, the, for the promise. This is a prayer journey to come alongside and put your shoulder into it with us, okay? Last week, we talked about serving with one accord, which means to put your shoulder into it. And our congregation, you guys do so well at that. Uh, we thank you for that. And uh, we uh, invite you to be with us on this 28-day uh, prayer journey as we put our shoulder uh, into this prayer journey. So uh, listen, if you are a part of the New Hope congregation, uh, we want you to be uh, joining this journey with us. Uh, go to the promise uh, table in the lobby, uh, and if you can uh, take this prayer journey booklet and help us pray over the course of the next uh, 28 days. This goes from this Monday, tomorrow, and it goes all the way through Easter Sunday. So go to the Promise table, grab some tickets to hand out to folks and invite them to the Promise this year, which is, of course, Easter week, uh, and also join with us in this 28 days of prayer. Are you ready to go to God's Word this morning? Amen. All right. Let's go to Zephaniah. Uh, this is where we've been at for now the fifth week. This is the fifth and final week, uh, and we are in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14, and uh, this is an excellent, awesome passage of Scripture as we conclude the book of Zephaniah. But first, <clears throat> a story. If you've ever driven uh, to California, uh, likely you have driven on I-80. Uh, and what you may not recognize on I-80 is that for a stretch of nearly 2,000 miles, you are driving parallel, within distance, within sight, of one of the greatest American feats in history, and that is uh, the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, built in the 1800s, largely by hand through a variety of terrains and, and dangerous territory uh, that was really unchartered. Uh, certainly not many maps had existed at that time. Uh, this was a, a monumental task in a day of horseback and largely by hand. It was the railroad that would lead to phrases, uh, well, it would lead to the, the time zone, the, because uh, the, the railroad all of a sudden connected this great country east to west, and, and so the time zones were created. And it led to uh, intriguing phrases like the wrong side of the tracks, which was because of the direction where the wind and the ashes would blow. And if you lived on the wrong side, that was the direction, that was the wrong side of the tracks. The first people to go uh, was not the construction team, it was the surveyors. Uh, these were hardy men, these were, these were courageous men, and they would go out in, in, a, in a dangerous territory, of course, on horseback, and they would go out and they would mark the territory, the best navigable route from east to west across this amazing uh, uncharted territory called America. And this was the Union Pacific, and it started in Omaha, and it went all the way towards the west until it reached the Central Pacific. One of these men was Grenville Dodge. Uh, Grenville Dodge uh, uh, was a Civil War uh, member. He was a member of the Civil War. And, and Grenville Dodge was one of the chief architects of the route. And in fact, he met Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln asked Grenville, what is, the best, uh, uh, what is the best route? And Grenville told him the route which would one day become the Union Pacific. And so Grenville became an amazing guy in this, uh, in this cohort of people. And he was one of the chief architects of the route and a main surveyor as he went out across the land. So Grenville, get this, uh, Grenville was such a hardy man, and he was so out front on horseback, and he would take stakes with him, lath is what the surveyors would call them, and he would mark out the navigable route from east to west across the country, and he would mark the route with stakes as he went out on horseback, and as he went out in front of what would then be the construction team behind him. Politicians in Washington, D.C., so eager to hear about the progress of the route, they sent uh, a message via the ancient form of texting 
called the Telegraph, and they sent word to the West. The question was this, where is Dodge? And the people from the West telegraphed back to the politicians in Washington, D.C., this phrase on the screen right here. Nobody knows where he is, but everyone knows where he has been. Isn't that a great word picture? Nobody knows where he is. Everybody knows where he's been because of what he has left behind. As we reach the, uh, the, uh, the end of the tracks of Zephaniah, Zephaniah has clearly marked out along the path. Some people may ask, well, where is God? I, where is he? I don't see him. I, where, where is he? And and, 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 and this is why the prophets and the apostles have gone before us. They are the surveyors. They have put the stakes in the ground through the great path of Scripture, through, uh, through crazy terrain and through undulating surfaces and across ravines and rivers and all of this. The prophets and the apostles have gone before us marking the territory. This is what God is like. In fact, it was both John and Peter, followers of our Lord Jesus Christ, who wrote these two verses of Scripture to tell us about who God is. And in John, he says this, no one has ever seen God. <laughs> you say, well, where is God? John says no one has ever seen God, but guess what? The only God who is at the Father's right hand, he has made him known. Uh, we can't see God, but we certainly know where he's been. And Peter, that great apostle, would say, though you have not seen him, you love him. Do you love him? And though you do not now see him, you believe in him and are filled with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. These are men, the surveyors of the scripture, who go on before us and they, they're moving east to west and they're, they're taking us along this route and we have confidence as believers to know that though we cannot see God, my friend, we can know who he is. And we can know what he's like because we know where he has been. This is the great passage of Zephaniah as he has laid out markers through this rugged landscape. And today we reach the apex of scripture of Zephaniah, which some call, verse 17 we'll get to in a moment, some call it the boldest statement in the Bible. Another commentator calls it the most stunningly beautiful passage in all of scripture. We'll get to verse 17 in a moment. But first point is this. We have something to sing about, don't we? We have something to sing about. We have it. Look at this, verse 14. Sing, <laughs> rejoice, shout, exalt. Sing, shout, rejoice, exalt. Look at this. Sing, O loud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel, rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter of Zion. Sing, shout, rejoice, exalt. Sing, shout, rejoice, exalt. The, the, the Christian, listen, listen. The Christian tradition is so significant because guess what? We are a singing congregation. And not just New Hope, by the way. All throughout this world, in every country, in every culture, and in every language, wherever Jesus Christ is professed as Lord, guess what the people do? They come together and they sing. They sing. They rejoice. Why? Because we have a living Savior. We have a, we have a Savior who conquered death, who forgives sin, who has defeated our enemy. We have a Savior, and so we rejoice and we sing about it. We rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, don't we? Amen. We rejoice. There, there's that sing, shout, loud, rejoice, exalt. And then he says, O daughters, twice he says this. This is interesting. O daughter, O daughter. He's talking to his people. The people of the Israel community who were about to face oppression and judgment and difficulty and trials and tribulation and distress. But he says to them, listen, O oh daughter, if you want to know how much depth of love a father has, ask him about his daughters. My third daughter just turned 13 last Sunday, uh, which now makes me a father of three teenage girls, and the owner of plenty of ammunition. Okay. <laughs> just, just, just clarify. Okay. Just clarify. So, but 
Last Sunday, we gathered together with this 13-year-old, this beautiful Darcy, full of life and joy, because she adds so much color to my life. That's why I tell her, Darcy, you add so much color. I tell her, my life would be black and white, dry and boring. You are like digital HD TV. Darcy, you just add so much joy, so much color. And so we took time last Sunday. We went around. I said, hey, this is, what, this is dad, right? Dad, this is what dads do. I say, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go around, and everybody here, we're going to tell Darcy the best thing we like about her, and nobody can repeat anybody else's. Everybody's got to be different. And so we went around, and we told this and that, and then this is it. Sing, rejoice, exalt. Sing, rejoice, exalt. This is about joy. This is the depth of the Father's love. And here we have a great passage of Scripture where Zephaniah tells the people to sing, shout, rejoice. Think about that. Think about if we took time right now to go A to Z and shout aloud to the Lord the type of God he is, who he is, and what he's done. I mean, if we took time to do that, we would come up with things like, man, he's from A to Z, right? He's awesome. He's beautiful. He's courageous. He's our deliverer. He is eternal. He is faithful. He is good. He is happy. He's irresistible. He's joyous and jealous. He's king. He's lover. He's magnificent. He's near. He's omnipresent. He's powerful. He's quick. He's, he's resurrected. How about that one? Uh, he's savior. He's true. He's unlimited. He's victorious. He's excellent. He's yearning. And he offers Zion as our reward. That's just A to Z. That's just real brief. But think about it. So sing, shout, rejoice, exalt. Sing, shout, rejoice, exalt. This is what he says. Well, okay, well, that's A to Z, but what does Zephaniah say? What, what do we have to sing about? Oh, he, okay, he'll tell you. Verse 15. How about this? A clear record. A clear record. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. Wow. Now, by now, in Zephaniah, let's put this in context. By now, we have heard that we are guilty of idolatry, rebellion, vacillation, backsliding, apathy, complacency, pride, ego. I mean, all, you list it. It's there. But then you have this great exclamation. The Lord has taken away your enemies. Taken away. What does this mean, uh, taken away? It means this, uh, literally it means this, to withdraw charges. <laughs> to withdraw charges. The charges are there, yes, but the Lord, he speaks of a day when the Lord would withdraw the charges against us. I was talking with a man this week in, our, in my office and he was sharing with me that the sins of his youth still haunt him. And I looked at him and I said, brother, me too. One of the memory verses lately has been in the Psalms. Uh, David says, remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. Pardon my guilt for it is great. But then I challenged this man with this, that I've had to learn how to pray this. I've had to learn not to continue to ask for forgiveness for the same old things that I've always, have you ever done that? Where you ask for forgiveness for the things you've already said you're sorry for, you've already turned away from them, but you still deal with guilt. Man, how I treated that person, how I, so I challenged him to begin to pray this way. Begin to pray with thanksgiving that God has already cleared away the debt because of what Jesus has done and help me, Father, to remove the guilt that is now upon my heart. And help me to stand with confidence because you have taken away my judgment. This is the same word in Zechariah. We'll get to that book some other day in the life of New Hope. Same word in Zechariah when the Lord says about the high priest, remove his filthy garments. It, take them away. No longer filthy. You are in right standing with the Lord. This is, this is only God can do this. He gives us a clear record. But not just a clear record. Uh, he has conquered the enemy. <laughs> Amen? Verse 15, the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. 
Uh, now, for Israel at this time, uh, most assuredly, it represented the nations. They were coming in to oppress, and, and, and they were going to be a tool of discipline in God's hand to certainly sharpen them. Uh, but certainly, uh, the, the, the true and better, if we could call it that, enemy of the people of Israel was none other than Satan himself. It's none other than the accuser of the brothers. And look at the great thing that he says as Zephaniah says, listen, there's coming a day, not only will the Lord take away judgment against you, he will also clear, wipe away your enemies. When you think about your life, uh, your past may haunt you. Other people may shame you. But you have a God that stands with you. You have an enemy who will accuse you and will call you things and will call to mind those things that should bring shame upon your life because they were done as shameless acts of rebellion against the Most High God. But listen, we have a God who has conquered the enemy. He has taken away judgments. And the great passage of Zephaniah would say, sing and shout and rejoice and exalt. Sing, shout, rejoice, exalt. What a great Savior. I mean, some people will sing about and shout and exalt about their favorite March Madness team like Michigan playing at 12.10 p.m. I, I know. <laughs> uh, or Michigan State playing later this afternoon, who plays my wife's hometown of Kansas. So I'm a torn man. Uh, so we'll sing, we'll shout about that, right? But listen, the best thing to sing and shout about is a God who has conquered the enemy and has cleared our record. And not just that, but he's a comforting king. Comforting king. Verse 15 goes on to say, The king of Israel, the king of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. That phrase there, in your midst, means this. Literally, it means he's at the center. And put yourself in the shoes of the people of Israel. They, they grew up in a culture. They, they were delivered from the nation of Egypt. And as they traveled with the tabernacle, they would, they would tear it down and then set it back up. And every time they set it back up, guess what was at the center? It was the tabernacle. It was the glory. It was, the midst, it was God's presence in the midst of the people. It represented their security, their safety, and their hope for the future. The worst thing that could happen to Israel is that the presence of God was removed. That was the absolute worst thing. In fact, the, the, the most devastating thing in the scripture was uh, the phrase Ichabod. And some of you know that phrase. It means that the glory of God has what? What does it mean? Has gone, departed from Israel. How devastating is it to think that God's glory has been removed? Think of it. What would happen at New Hope if we all gathered and God's presence wasn't at the center, how devastating would that be? What is there to sing about? What is there to rejoice about? But here we have a God who says that the king of Israel is at the center. He's in your midst. And as a result of God at the very core of your heart, what does he say? He says, you shall never again fear evil. Isn't that true? That if God is near, what have we to fear? If God is near, what have we to fear? If he is at the center of our lives and we have confidence in him and who he is, we can roll our burdens to him. We can cast our anxieties to him because he's at the center. He's at the core. Uh, he's here in our midst. Isn't that true? He's here. He's with us. He's awesome and he's powerful. And so we have something to sing about. Because, number two, because God is mighty to save. You guys are so lame. <laughs> He's mighty to save. <laughs> Listen, this is our God. Look at this, verse 16, 17. On that day, okay, what day? Zephaniah, he's a surveyor. He's going out through the land. He's, he's pointing ahead. He's moving on ahead. It hadn't happened in his day. He's pointing to it that day. Well, what day is he talking about? He's talking about a day that your record would be clear. He's talking about a day that the enemy would be conquered. And he's talking about a day that the Lord would be in your midst. What better day is there than the incarnation when the indwelling God of the universe came down and dwelt in our midst? He is called Emmanuel, which means what? 
God with us. It's his presence. There it is. It is the glorious presence of God established in the midst of his people, fulfilling all of what Zephaniah has talked about. And as he says, on that day, it shall be said in Jerusalem, fear not, O Zion. Jesus raises from the dead. And he meets grieving women who have come to anoint his body with ointments. And what does he say to these women? Fear not. We have a living Savior. Fear not. Let not your hands grow weak. Boy, there's a great cross reference in Galatians 6 about uh, do not grow weary in well-doing. For in proper season you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. Let not your hands grow weak. And then we come to this boldest statement in the Bible. It's a verse I have on my wall in my office. I've had it for the past year. One of our coworkers, uh, Pastor Joe, and his wife, uh, Tracy, bought this verse for me because they know that I need this verse. Uh, this verse is for me. It's for you. It's a verse, by the way, that I have a hard time believing because I know that some of you feel like me that it seems at times as, as if God merely tolerates me. He puts up with me. But like uh, maybe a dad would whose arms are folded and he's distant. So God knows I need this verse because it's hard to believe that verse 17 would say, the Lord is in your midst. He is a mighty one to save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. And he will exult over you with loud singing. I read that verse. Uh, here's what I think. I, my, here, you want to know my skeptical, like, uh, you know, my skeptical Craig response? Yeah, it's a good verse for my wife. Because I believe that, 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 I believe that that's how God views her. Because that's how I view her. With joy, delight, radiance, you're awesome. But God to me, not a chance. So isn't that Interesting. That, that I feel that that verse is appropriate for her because I think that that's how God must see her, but, but me, now nah, I'm tolerated. He is mighty to save. He's a warrior. He's a warrior. He's a fighter. And what is he, what is he, what is he a fighter for? He's a fighter to save, to save, to rescue. He shall take away their sin. Behold, the Lamb of God, who what? Here he is. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's a Savior. More than you need health care, more than you need national security, more than you need a wall on your southern border, you need salvation, my friend. Amen. You need rescue from your sin. You need that big wall that exists between you and a holy God to be torn down. And guess what? You can't do it, but Jesus offers it. In his Son, Jesus Christ, the Lord and the Savior. But look at, this, look at this. He will rejoice over you with gladness. Really? Everybody say, really? Rejoice over, over who? Oh, Israel, yes. Collective whole. The people of God, his chosen people, for sure, it, it, first and foremost, written to them by application and extension, written for every believer who has been grafted into the vine through Jesus Christ. He rejoices over you. Men, this is so hard to believe. But listen, you may not believe it, but you better receive it. You better receive it. That there's a God of the universe who actually, truly rejoices over you. Application, illustration would go this way. I have one son, Kyle. Love that guy. Love him. And this little kid, this week, I was, I, I, dude, I know you lost my sleeping bag. Man, this is before the parenting conference, so it was, it was a little, <laughs> dude, I know you lost my sleeping bag, man. Where is it? Where did it go? And he sat there, and he did this. I, 
I wouldn't know even if I did lose it. <laughs> you know what I did? I, did, I laughed. I was like, dude, you're awesome, man. I mean, he wouldn't even know if he did lose it. He's just absent-minded. But I love that kid, right? Listen, even at his worst moments, in fact, I would go so far as a dad to say this. Because of his worst moments, my love for him overflows with joy. I rejoice over him. I can't explain it. How, can it. how can I have both at the same time? How can, as a dad, I have frustration at times, but massive amounts of love for him? And if me, if me, oh God, even me, though I am evil, if I can have that type of love for a son who at times is absent-minded, how is it so hard to believe that there is a God of the universe whose love is perfect and he loves me in spite of my weaknesses and he rejoices over me? That's marvelous love. And he quiets you. He quiets you. Look at this, this phrase here. He, he quiets you by his love. It means this. It means to be put at rest, to be stilled, or to be silenced. He quiets us with his love. I, I know you've had moments in life, life where your heart is in turmoil. I know that. That's a human existence. We, you, you, get, you get all nervous, don't you? It's, there's fear. There's anxieties. There's stress. There's difficulties. And I know that. And then comes a Savior who in the quiet moments of the evening or in the morning, he calms us. Have you ever seen the movie, uh, this one, uh, Alexander? Uh, the movie is called Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. It, but it's a great family movie. Uh, have, but have you ever had one of those days, a terrible, horrible, no good, awful, just awful day? Have you ever had one of those? You know, my Monday and Tuesday started like that this week, and I just, I just, I just didn't want to... I didn't want to be a pastor, and I didn't want to do, I didn't want to do anything Monday and Tuesday. Just internal, ter- we all have that. There's days you don't want to go to your work. There's days you don't want to parent your children. There's days you just want to, like, hibernate, right? Just... Everybody else is hashtag blessed. <laughs> and, 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 and Alexander in the movie, he says, well, I had a crap day. You know, that's what he says. Well, th- some days are like that. you just bad days, right? And then Tuesday morning comes along, and early that morning before I left, my wife says, Craig, thank you for being faithful. And I get into the office, and I get an email from a family in the church. They've been watching online because they're out of the area for three months or four months, and they emailed me, thank you for preaching the word. And and then I get a a third contact. It was another very, very nice thing. And then moments later, I'm still praying. uh, This time, I'm praying through uh, Zephaniah 3, Tuesday morning. And, uh, and I'm still struggling with this fact that he exalts over me. Really? He reads really? And I'm studying this verse, and the phone rings. It's Pastor Bruce. Pastor Bruce calls me. He says, Craig, I just want to encourage you today. Thank you for being obedient. Thank you for being faithful. And I just want to call and pray for you. And he prayed for me, and I just, I cried, and I said, Bruce, I said, you're an answer to prayer. I said, because this is verse 17, and God used you to bless me. And he used my wife and he used other people. Man, that's, that's God. He, he's able to, so I asked, do you need that? Do you need to know that he rejoices and he quiets you by his love? And second question, do you know somebody in your life who you should do that for? That you should reach out and be a conduit of blessing. But listen, he exalts over you with loud singing. This is, this is fabulous here. This is fabulous. He <coughs> literally, he proclaims joy over you. He proclaims joy. It's a, it's a proclamation of joy. Exalts over you with Loud singing. Ladies, let me tell you this. I know that there's ladies here who the only loud voices you have heard through your entire life have been a dad who has shamed you or men who have abused you or have shouted at you. And you, some of you ladies, I know this, that you feel unloved and you feel unwanted by men. But listen, there is a God of the universe whose loud voice over you is full of joy. 
And Zephaniah 3.17 is one of those freedom in Christ truth statements that says that in Christ, that my Father views me as accepted and loved, and he rejoices over me with loud singing. And after the service, uh, Deanne Jennings, uh, uh, one of our staff, will be up here with, with freedom in Christ statement cards, which has Zephaniah 317, and I want you to come if you need those, uh, to operate in the truth of God's word of who you are and who God views you as, as a daughter of the Most High God. But this is our God. Uh, Skipping, for time's sake, verse 18, uh, drop to verse 19. So here we have, we have reason to sing, uh, something to sing about, because God is mighty to save, and he changes our shame into praise. Here, the whole theme of Zephaniah comes cascading to this moment. The theme of Zephaniah has been changing shame to praise. And look at all of this prophetic expectation of Zephaniah, which would be fulfilled 650 years later with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What God was about to do for the people of God. Here it is. Behold, at that time, I will deal with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcasts. I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in. At that time, when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes. And the book of Zephaniah ends with three powerful words, thus says the Lord, or says the Lord. This is a fireworks finale. (laughs) This is a fireworks finale. Zephaniah says that the surveyor is going out in front of you, and there's coming a day when he will deal with your oppressors, He will will confront your enemy for you. He will be in your midst and he will guard you from the enemy. He will also gather the lame. What is the lame? Well, that is those who limp. Not physically. It's a metaphor to those whose hearts are wounded, who have been oppressed and afflicted, and the Lord will gather them together. He will gather in the outcast. Who is that? Those who have been rejected by society, the no good for nothings. They've been pushed and shoved out because they're not good, they're not wise, and they're not, you know, in the world's eyes, they have no value. But guess what? The Lord will gather them in. He will gather them in. And then he will do this. He will change shame to praise. Shame. Not just the feeling of shame, but the cause of shame. Not just the feeling that I'm, I'm, I'm shameful. He will go to the very root causes and he will transform it. He will transform shame to praise. This is the God that we serve. The great prophetic expectation that there was coming a day and God did it in his son Jesus Christ where Christ went to the cross and he bore our shame. And he is now making it for himself a people for his possession and glory gathered from all corners of the world, gathered from every nation, tribe, tongue, and language and together with one voice and one body we are a memorial to the Lord. And we sing to him, and he sings back to us. This is the God that we serve. So what do we do with this? Here we go. Action step one. Ask God to change your shame to praise. Ask him. Ask him. Ask him to go to those deep areas that once defeated you, because those areas that once defeated you can now define you. Do you get that? Those areas that once brought you shame can now be used for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those places where you once were hiding in shame can now be actually a platform of ministry to declare his glory. How powerful is that? Have you ever asked God to take that area of your life that is the biggest area of shame and transform it for his glory? Ask him. Ask him. How about this? Uh, How about developing a battle plan against fear? I know many of you have fear. I have children that have uh, dealt with fear in their lives, and we have had a battle plan. Memory versus a battle plan. You shall no longer fear. The Lord is in your midst. At the very core of that battle plan has got to be a, a, a scripture memory verse about the fact that the Lord our God is in our midst. He's here. He's, he's with us. Uh, he, he is in our midst. Our memory verse has been Psalm 56. When I am afraid, 
I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? It is putting God at the center of the fear. It's choosing faith over fear. It's putting God in the very center of your life and integrating him into every component of your life so that you will no longer fear evil. How about this? Call on the Lord. Any message in Zephaniah has got to end with this one about seeking the Lord. His whole, uh, his whole motive in writing is to warn the people of what comes if you're unrepentant, if, if you don't seek the Lord. And he calls us back to himself, seek the Lord, seek the Lord. Are you complacent? Well, pursue him. Are you backsliding? Well, turn around and, and, and chase after him. Uh, are you vacillating? Make up your mind. Chase after him, pursue him. This is Zephaniah's goal, seek the Lord. And I know that that will hit each one of us at different levels based on where you're at in the Lord, but especially if you've never made a decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, it means repenting of your pride, trusting in Jesus as your sole source of righteousness and hope for eternal future, and believing that there's a God in heaven who will clear your record, conquer your enemy, and bring comfort to your soul. So this is Zephaniah. <laughs> Zephaniah tells us who God is. And who is God? Mighty to save. It tells us who the enemy is, and who is he? Conquered and defeated. It tells us who we are, and who are we? Well, God rejoices over us with loud singing. He exalts over us, and he quiets us with his love, and it tells us what our future is, that in him there's coming a day when he will gather us in. He will bring in the lame, and the wounded, and the outcast, and the American Christian, and the Iranian Christian, and the Syrian Christian, and the and in the, in the Christians from India, he will gather all of us together in that beautiful assembly called eternal glory. And there in that eternal assembly, he will rejoice over us with loud singing. And antiphonally, we will sing back to him because he is worthy of all praise. Would you bow with me in prayer? God, we glorify you today. Lord, knowing that we are not just to be hearers of the word, Lord, help your people to be doers of the word, to now put the word into action, to praise you with answered prayer, to sing and rejoice with all of their heart, to exalt in you because you exalt in them, to rejoice in the record that is clear because of the Lord Jesus Christ and to operate in the truth statements of who they are in the Lord Jesus. Lord, remove fear from our midst, remove fear from our hearts, and may we operate in the truth of your word, that you are a God who is mighty, mighty to save. And we give you great praise and thanks for us. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said.